What did it mean that imperial princes were caged in the 17th and 18th century Ottoman Empire? We'll discuss that today on Footnoting History. Hello and welcome to Footnoting History. This is Elizabeth, but before I begin, I want to remind you that a transcribed version of this episode is available on our YouTube channel. And, of course, further reading and images can be found on our website, www.footnotinghistory.com, as well as links to our shop and Patreon. I want to start this episode by reading an excerpt from the memoirs of Sir John Malcolm. In the 1700s, Malcolm had been the British ambassador to the Safavid Empire, which was geographically next door to the Ottoman Empire, the focus of this episode. In his memoirs, Malcolm stated, quote, The princes were immured in the harem and saw only women and eunuchs. A monarch who was never permitted to leave this prison till he ascended the throne was likely to be effeminate and inefficient. It was hardly possible that he could resist the intoxication of absolute power. The unlimited indulgence of his passions seemed almost the certain consequence of his former privations and his entire want of experience. End quote. Now, this passage is, as noted, about the Safavid Empire and Shah, but a similar development had happened in the Ottoman Empire since the early 1600s. While for Malcolm we have the European and outsiders less than complimentary view of the changes in dynastic choice, if you will, of these empires, we need to tread carefully as we examine these changes and their impact. That topic, then, is the focus of this episode, if you couldn't tell from the title or blurb. In my episode on Roxelana, Suleiman's wife, I touched upon how dynastic secession was handled in the early days of the 16th century Ottoman Empire. Given the choice of non-Ottoman concubines for the mothers of future sultans and the lack of primogenitor where the oldest son was the natural successor, the favorite concubines attempted to raise her son to be the heir to the throne. Once a son of the sultan came of age, he would be appointed as the governor of a region within the empire and there the young man would learn how to govern. It was, in many ways, a very hands-on apprenticeship. The age at which the son was appointed could vary. Murad II, for example, was only around nine years old when declared governor. Likewise, as sultan, Murad II appointed his son, later Mehmet II, as governor when he was 11. In this way, the heirs to the throne learned what was expected of them. Their education was not only limited to governance, however, as the boys were also tutored in various subjects. I'm going to borrow directly from my Roxelana episode, so quote me. Quote, as the Ottomans conquered land, they also captured and forced people into enslavement. Enslaved Christian boys were sometimes elevated to the rank of Janissary or the Sultan's personal military force, while enslaved Christian women sometimes found themselves becoming the concubines of the Sultan. For over a century, the Ottoman Sultans did not marry. Their concubines, who were converted to Islam, bore their children, and, if the child was a male, the concubine and the son retired to a far-off province where the boy could learn how to govern. By having the sultan's children be born of enslaved women, the Ottomans cut down on the potential conflict of warring branches of the family tree, end quote. However, even though family branches were trimmed in this way, the number of concubines that a sultan had meant that there was often many potential claimants to the sultanate. It wasn't only the sultan that a son needed to curry favor with. The concubines often held much power as each sought to elevate one of their own sons. And of course, there were the janissaries or soldiers of the sultan who had their own favorites as well. For this reason, towards the end of his reign, Mehmet II, mentioned above as having been appointed governor at 11, before he became sultan as a teenager, made royal fratricide legal. According to the records, Mehmet II said, Of any of my sons that ascends the throne, it is acceptable for him to kill his brothers for the common benefit of the people. After Mehmet II died in 1481, this practice became commonplace for over a century. After the death of the sultan, the new sultan would have killed any male relative who was a threat to his control, even if that meant having younger brothers assassinated. The most famous example was committed by Mehmet III, who became sultan in 1595, who had 19 of his brothers and half-brothers killed. His youngest brother was 11. This mass execution was too much for the Ottoman people. After Mehmet III's death in 1603, which, coincidentally, is the same year Elizabeth I died, the policy surrounding dynastic secession shifted again. First, secession would now be based on age. The eldest male heir would claim the sultanate. This heir could be the sultan's brother or nephew or son, just whatever male in the royal line was the oldest upon the death of the sultan. And now the bigger change. Instead of killing your brother, 
you would confine him. And thus we have come full circle to the beginning of this episode. What was the kafis? The word kafis has multiple meanings, but for the Ottoman princes, one is most accurate. Kafis meant cage, even if a gilded one. These apartments of the crown prince, as they were known, were located in what we now call the Topkapi Palace, or the Canon Palace, but the residence was actually called the New Palace for centuries. It was built in the mid-15th century and for over 200 years was not only the sultan's main residence, but also its headquarters. You may be wondering which sultan ordered the building of the new palace. It was, yet again, Mehmet II. Yes, Mehmet II legalized fratricide and also, unwittingly, had created the palace that his descendants were locked into when the policy of murder switched to that of containment. Something about what a tangled web we weave, but take out the little bit about deceiving. In various records of the Ottoman Empire, it is usually stated that the imperial princes lived in the harem. However, they did have their own rooms as noted above. The question is, how much interaction did they actually have with others during their years in the kafis? Some records seem to indicate isolation. Others seem to indicate that the young men were spoiled and treated as children with every need tended. Now, the former could be explained why... The sultans who came from the kafis were often unstable and in today's parlance suffered from mental illness. The latter, however, supports the view that these sultans were spoiled and unfit to rule as their entire lives were catered to. So which is true? Well, somewhere in the middle. The imperial princes did have their own rooms near the harem, but they were not in the harem, which makes sense as eventually they would be young men and only the sultans and eunuchs were allowed in the harem. It seems to be a foreign invention of the imperial princes being raised in decadent luxury among their father, uncle, or brother's concubines. As can be seen in the quote by John Malcolm that it was stated that the young men were in the harem and in this way became effeminate, and, due to the belief system of the 1600s and 1700s, were unfit to rule. Malcolm, Scottish himself, was writing less than two centuries after John Knox, the Scottish founder of Presbyterianism, railed against the idea of a queen ruling over the land. But it seems that total isolation, such as we might think of as solitary confinement, was also not the reality of existence for the imperial princes. Around their imperial rooms were hallways and passageways and rooms for a myriad number of servants. They did, in this way, have contact with others, including their mothers. It was still an uncertain existence. At any moment, your execution could be called for and carried out. The first imperial prince to experience the kafis, or gilded cage, at the Tokapi Palace was Mustafa, later Mustafa I, who was spared at the age of 12 when his 13-year-old brother was made sultan in 1603. It was this event that shifted the dynastic policy of the Ottomans, and then again when Ahmed died in 1617 and Mustafa, his brother, became sultan. From then on, the path to the sultanate was based on seniority. Mustafa, though, was unstable. His erratic behavior was known even when he lived in the crown prince's apartments. Accordingly, some, like his mother, hoped that his elevation to sultan would stop certain unbecoming actions, but it didn't. Mustafa was known for pulling off his vizier's turbans and yanking their beards. He also allegedly threw coins to birds and fish. I say allegedly because his actual behavior is up for debate. We are unsure if the records were embellished or completely fabricated to justify the coup that removed him from power. His first reign didn't even last six months. He was returned to the Topkapi Palace. His second reign, which started around four years later after the murder of Sultan Osman II, his nephew, lasted almost a year. The reign started with the execution of anyone involved in the murder of his nephew, but like his previous rule, Mustafa was deemed incompetent and his mother ruled in his place. According to reports, Mustafa would travel around the palace knocking on doors asking if Osman, his dead nephew, was there. Interestingly, during the second reign, the Ottoman people referred to him as Mustafa the Saint. Modern historians call him Mustafa the Mad. In 1623, Mustafa was replaced by another nephew, but he did not die until 1640. We don't know if Mustafa was murdered or if he died from an epileptic seizure, as some have stated, but we do know that he lived 34 of his 48 years in the Kafas. The most infamous of the imperial princes who went from the Kafas to the Sultanate was Delhi Abraham or Ibrahim the Mad. Ibrahim was born in 1615 to Sultan Ahmed I, who passed away when he was a toddler. Ahmed I was succeeded by his brother, Mustafa, and then by his son, Murad IV. Once Murad IV became Sultan, Ibrahim was sent to the Kafis. He was seven years old. He remained there for 17 years, and during that time period, Murad IV had four of their brothers executed. 
any moment, as Ibrahim knew, could be his last. For 17 years, starting when he was seven. He wasn't executed, though. Instead, Murad IV died in 1640 and Ibrahim became the sultan. In fact, when told Murad was dead and he was the heir apparent, Ibrahim refused to believe the vizier or his mother. It was not until he examined his brother's dead body that he accepted the truth. At 24, Ibrahim was released from the kafis. Initially, Ibrahim ruled well. He relied on his vizier's guidance and even dressed in disguise to move into the world and see what it was like. The freedom must have been overwhelming. It is hard to separate fact from fiction from Ibrahim. He had many enemies, and most likely the most salacious stories of his reign came from others who wanted him out of power. For example, it was said that he believed a number of his concubines had betrayed him, so he had 280 of them drowned in the river. While horrifying and fascinating, as noted, these stories and others about Ibrahim's alleged madness were not recorded until a few decades after his death, making them less than trustworthy. They were written down by Dmitri Kantemir, Prince of Moldavia, in a work he started in 1711, the same year the prince switched his allegiance from the Ottoman Empire to Russia as he believed the former was rapidly declining. It is unsurprising, then, that he would record less than flattering rumors about Ottoman sultans and their form of secession. Facts that are more corroborated about Ibrahim's life, however, do show the impact of growing up in the imperial cage. He suffered from headaches and at times was unable to get up. His mother suggested he make himself feel better by visiting his harem often, and he did, leaving him with many potential heirs. He also had his vizier executed as well as others. His mother said of him in a letter to a later vizier that Ibrahim needed to be handled before he had both of them executed. Eventually, as Caroline Finkel explains, his mother worked with the Janissaries to have her own son removed from power. He did return for a short time, but was again removed, imprisoned, and executed at the age of 33. When did the use of the kafis end? Well, if we're being literal, then the use of the crown prince's rooms at the Topkapi Palace were not used after the mid-19th century because the Topkapi Palace was not used then. The sultans had built and preferred other places. However, just because the physical location was no longer housing the imperial princes, it did not mean this tradition was done. The last sultan of the Ottomans, Mehmet VI, lived for 56 years in the harem before ascending to the sultanate. Mehmet was close to his brother, and he did not fear execution as so many earlier inhabitants of the Kafis had to contend with. The mental and emotional impact of the Kafis, therefore, was over well before his reign. Like so much in history, when the use of the kafis ended depends on how you define your terms. Interested in owning some footnoting history merch? You can find out more through our shop link at www.footnotinghistory.com. Want to support the show and keep it open access? Our Patreon is at patreon.com forward slash footnoting history. You can also follow us on Twitter at History Footnote or on Facebook and Instagram as Footnoting History. And of course... The best stories are always in the footnotes.